Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich hier im Namen des CTS, das Campus für Theologie und Spiritualität Berlin, zu dieser heutigen Linkvorlesung. Mein Name ist Martin Scheiber, ich leite in Berlin das Projektbüro des CTS und ich bin kein Theologe, ich bin nur Philosoph. Ich äh, hoffe, Sie sehen mir das einigermaßen nach. Aber tatsächlich ist es so, dass ich bei der Arbeit sehr viel über Theologie lerne. Und am allermeisten lerne ich eigentlich hier in dieser Linkvorlesung über Theologie. Und ich vermute mal, dass es heute nicht anders formuliert. Was wir ähm, heute äh, hier bei dieser Linkvorlesung erfahren, äh, ist ein Vortrag von Dr. Dominic White. Ähm, er wird in seinem Vortrag auf die Verkörperung von Liturgie in einer sich radikal ändernden Gesellschaft eingehen. Zuvor jedoch ein paar biografische Stichpunkte über Dr. White. Dominic White wurde 1973 in Guildford, Großbritannien, geboren und studierte Classics in Cambridge. Am Londoner Imperial College erwarb er seinen PhD im Fach Civil Engineering im Bereich History of Science. In London, wo er an der Klosterkirche der Predigerbrüder von 1997 bis 2000 als Organist und Chorleiter arbeitete, lernte er den Dominikanerorden kennen. Nach seinem Ordenseintritt studierte er Theologie im Studienhaus der Dominikaner in Oxford sowie am Institut äh, Katholik in Paris. Im Anschluss an seine Priesterweihe war er unter anderem als Studierendenseelsorger in Newcastle und an der Northumbria University. Heute ist er als Acting Director und Dozent am Merritt Beaufort Institute of Theology in Cambridge tätig. Sein, Forsch sein Forschungsinteresse umfassen die Bereiche Theologie der Kunst und Kultur, Weisheitstheologie, Spiritualität, Liturgie in Verbindung zur Volksförmigkeit sowie kontemplative Metaphysik. Zwei Buchveröffentlichungen sind hervorzuheben. Einmal von 2015, The Lost Knowledge of Christ, und von 2020, How Do I Look? Theology in the Age of the Selfie. Dominic White ist Co-Gründer Co des innovativen und multimedialen Cosmo-Trans-Projekts, das Kunst, Spiritualität, Nachhaltigkeit neu zusammenbringt. Zudem ist er auch als Dichter und Komponist aktiv. Ein paar akustische Kostgruppen finden Sie auf der Seite soundcloud.com. Wenn Sie da in die Suchmaske Dominic White eingeben, finden Sie sehr schnell sein Profil, dass eine ganze Reihe von ich glaube, selbst Aufnahmen, die sie gemacht haben. Also da, äh, man sieht sie nicht, man hört sie nur, aber das ist sehr interessant. Sehr zu empfehlen. Dominic White lebt im Dominikanerkonvent in St. Michael in Cambridge. Heute jedoch beehrt er uns mit seiner Anwesenheit hier in Berlin. Und wir haben das große Vergnügen, seinen Vortrag zum Thema Re-Embodying Liturgy, a bridge in, between, church, and a radically changing society to learn. Dr. White wird seinen Vortrag auf Englisch halten. Er spricht jedoch sehr gut Deutsch, wie ich schon gesagt habe. Deswegen haben wir vereinbart, dass wir die Diskussionsrunde im Anschluss auf Deutsch führen werden. Lieber Dr. White, wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie hier sind. Und jetzt bleibt mir noch das Wort an Sie zu übergeben. Vielen Dank, Martin. Kleines Vorwort äh, auf Deutsch und der wichtig ist, dass ich, ich muss äh, meine Mitarbeiterin Veronika äh, vorstellen. So, Veronika, eine sehr gute Freundin von mir. Äh, Veronika ist Urbanistin und Placemaker, das ist heißt ein Ortschöpferin, ähm, Daumkünstlerin ähm, und sie hat ein sehr interessantes Projekt. Um, contemporary Hermitage, Zeitgenossische Hermitage. Und in seiner dritten Lesung, am Freitag, der äh, Amerika, äh, der ein bisschen dieses Projekt äh, vorstellen und beschreiben. Ähm, und das, ich glaube, das ist sehr wichtig in unserer Welt, in unserer Kirche, das ist nicht nur eine, eine Stimme, aber eine Frau, ein Mann, eine Lani, 
ein Priest, den eine europäische Mitarbeiter, äh, Veronika Stolbeckisch, äh, sie und seine Erma, Franziszek, äh, leben in Schweiz und ich bin in Englisch. Großbritannien ist noch da in Europa. <lacht> so, äh, danke, danke. Es tut mir leid, dass ich kann dieser Vorlesung auf Deutsch geben. Die Deutschen sprechen eine unbarische Englisch, das ist gar nicht für mich. Das Problem für mich, das ist, auf Deutsch muss man sehr klar sprechen und äh, ähm, aussprechen seines Ideen. Aber mein Deutsch ist dann ein bisschen Google Translate. So, ähm, okay. Ähm, Gehen wir auf Englisch. Wenn Sie bestellen nicht, äh, hören Sie bitte. Und danach, äh, als ähm, Martin hat gesagt, wir bekommen äh, Besprechungen und Fragen äh, auf Deutsch. Vielen Dank. So, what is ein ganz großes Theater? In German, as in English, the expression ein ganz großes Theater, a great big theater, can have different senses. For example, das Rheinische Landestheater in Neuss, ein ganz großes Theater, viel größer als manch, manch anderes. That's a positive sense. The regional theater in Neuss is much bigger than many others. But according to Start Trading magazine in 2019, Brexit is a ganz großes Theater. Diese Dramaturgie hätte man nicht besser verpassen können. No one could write a better play than this. As you read the piece, you sense that Brexit is a play of excess, of drama, in the sense of almost impossible exaggeration. Again, an article about a visit of FIFA president Gianni Infantino to Russia, where he claimed to have seen the best football World Cup of all time. The article shows a picture of him at the Bolshoi Valley in the US himself, Vladimir Putin, and the article denounces all this as a gun's horse's tail. This isn't true, it isn't real. Instead, violence, doping, and security problems are probably. So, a great big theatre can be good theatre. It can also be melodrama, a high drama of excess and tragedy, which is painful and exhausting to watch. And, as in the case of Brexit, a drama in which spectators cannot avoid being involved, whether they want to or not. Or it can be a great big theatre in the sense of a great big fiction, a staged attempt to deceive on a large scale, something which is absurd and at best we can only laugh at. Now liturgy can be all of these. It can be good liturgy, which like good theatre draws us into itself. This experience can be cathartic, purifying, as the drama we experience on the stage takes place inside ourselves. We leave with a change happening in us. The architectural space may be an important factor, as clearly it is in the case of the Valley Regional Theatre of Noyce. The liturgy can be a high drama. After all, one of the meanings of the Mass is that it is a making present of the sacrificial death and resurrection of Christ, the great cathartic drama of all time. Or, if the liturgy is done badly and with excess and exaggeration, cannot be painful for us to be involved in. We want to escape what we can't. Perhaps it actually reveals conflicts that we experience around us in society, in the church, even within ourselves. At its worst, Liturgy can be completely uninspiring, something stupid, and as is being suggested in the case of the FIFA president's visit to Russia, something untrue. The reality is not what we see and hear. Liturgy and theatre also have in common that they can inspire and captivate us, take us up, our table, 
all bore us. If we are bored, we feel disconnected. This is not feeling me. I cannot relate to it. It has nothing to do with me or my life. Or the world we live in now, this radically changing world. The philosopher Martin Heidegger discussed boredom in great detail in the 1929-30 lecture series um, The Fundamental Begriff of Der Metaphysik. When we are bored, says Heidegger, we discover time as time. How long till mass is finished and I can go? How long till this lecture is finished and I can go? But for Heidegger, the boring, not just being bored, but the boring is a mood of Befindlichkeit which makes us realise the emptiness and the nothingness of things. And this begins a journey of discovery about time and being. Zeit und Zeit. But if this is the case with liturgy, it is a devastating critique. Is not liturgy meant to reveal truth and meaning to us? In the Bible, we see the greatest amount of liturgy in the book of Revelation. And it is in this context of the heavenly liturgy that the depths of reality are revealed to John as he sees the real meaning of the conflicts and disasters which are taking place in the world or will take place. The book ends with a triumph in liturgy, the marriage feast of the Lamb of God. Our birthday liturgy is not something we do to keep God happy. Our earthly liturgy is a participation in the heavenly liturgy. So if liturgy has become boring theatre, it is bad liturgy. But is a comparison of liturgy and theatre really a good one? Is liturgy really a kind of theatre? Isn't theatre just something we watch without taking part? After all, if you go to a play tonight in Berlin, you don't need to attend the rehearsals, do you? Surely the liturgy is the liturgy of the whole body of Christ, which, as Vatican II teaches, requires the active participation of all its members. The interpretation of this Vatican II teaching has been a point of controversy in interpreting the liturgical reform of Vatican II, how the liturgy should be celebrated with active participation. But good theatre, like good liturgy, involves us. The good play, I am not bored, I am caught up in it. Good actors know how to connect with the audience. They may even be getting the audience to respond with words or with gestures. The 1960s, the time of liturgical reform, was a time of experiment in theatres too. Sometimes actors would leave the stage and come out among people and hide all over their cars or whatever. The question of space again. And the theatre, like the liturgy, involves us in another sense. It needs to produce shared experience. While I simply cannot know the whole of your individual experience, it does matter that we have fundamentally the same experience. For example, at Mass, it is important that we experience that I and we receive the body of Christ, that I and we are the body of Christ. Now, is this okay so far? Not too fast? Clear? Okay. In the back. The anthropologist Victor Turner, I'm very grateful to Veronica for introducing me to his work, um, who had a family background in theatre, used the Latin word communitas. He said that communitas has something of a quality of flow. But it may arise, and often does, arise spontaneously and unanticipated. It doesn't need rules to trigger it off, sense of community. In theological language, it's sometimes a matter of grace rather than a matter of law. Flow is structural, whereas communitas is pre-structural. While, says Turner, feeling generalised is more readily than thought. We can't just keep up being spontaneous all the time. So the experience of community becomes the memory of communitas. So as communitas striving to replicate itself, 
strives to replicate itself, it develops a social structure. Developing our husband's thought, Edith Turner argues for community as active practice rather than fixed identity. This could be theatre, but actually it sounds very like liturgy, active practice. Indeed, Christy Pearson, reflecting on the Turner's work, sees theatre as heir or inheritor to the transformative energy of ritual. Ritual, which again brings us back to liturgy. But if we don't have a shared sense of engagement in liturgy, of being us celebrating the liturgy together, whether through shared attention, shared meaning, or carrying out ritual actions, then at least some of the people there will be formed. Maybe even those leading the liturgy will be formed. There is a problem between the church and society, like the people who don't come to church anymore, and there is a problem within the church. Let us explore these a bit more. So what we suggest is becoming clear is that we have two interrelated breakings apart. The first is a breaking apart within the church on the question of liturgy, which we experience as liturgical conflict, often associated with other issues of doctrine and practice. The terms traditionalist, conservative, progressive and liberal are often used but more often by one party to criticise the other one. Well, in that case, who really are we? What do we really believe? The second breaking apart is between religion and society. I show a church here, and of course we are religiously very pluralist in Europe, there you are, there's a procession in church and a procession in the shopping centre. The breaking apart within the church and between religion and society are also interconnected, especially for Christians, because Christians live in society. Christianity is an incarnate religion. God became human, dwelt among us. We know that to be a Christian is not to be in a religion which lives separately from society, but a religion in which we love our neighbour. We share the hopes and fears, as government space, of our fellow men and women. We build together, working together with all people of good will. This is why we have debates in the church about how far we can change and adapt to a radically changing society. Are these changes in society for the better, making us more Christian? Or is society going away from Christ? Should we then withdraw from society? The synodal process has revealed different views within the church, which might be seen as liberal progressive on one hand and conservative traditionalist on the other. Often these differences are reduced to cartoons or to stereotypes. People, both individuals and communities, are more complex. And what as Christians can we do for people who no longer go to church? People who no longer believe in Christ, no longer believe in God. I know Catholics who are working as humanist celebrants of namings, marriages and funerals in order to be Christ's presence at key events in people's lives. Certainly, what is clear is that if people no longer believe in or practice Christianity, this does not mean that they have given up ritual practice or that ritual has simply turned into theatre. Rather, there are new rituals, new theatres. In the collection of studies, Bohan Glatt by Warpah, What Does Europe Believe In?, edited by Thomas Steenberg, Thomas Eppenschberger and Ulrich, we see that people do not simply stop believing because they stop going to church. They sometimes keep some of their Christian beliefs or employ syncretism. But more often than being irreligious, don't like religion, they maintain a distant friendliness towards religion. Some of my family are like that, maybe some of yours. Sometimes people re-evaluate and re-categorize. Secular art become, can become a new place of finding meanings. Thomas Eggenschberger sees one reversal between museums and cathedrals. Old cathedrals are visited by tourists as if they were museums of the past. 
while new galleries and museums are visited as places of devotion by streams of pilgrims, because, quote, they accommodate the wish for re-enchantment and aestheticization of life. For Ulrich Engel, the presence of sacred art in museums is not a secularization of the church, whereby the museum is the new cathedral, but rather it is evidence of common ground with Christianity. There are admittedly no logical commonalities, but in Brian Ludwig Wittgenstein's family resemblance theory, Engel says that both religion and art deal with the depiction of meaning in signs, symbols, similes and images. For Pope St John Paul II, the church and artists have in common the theme of the human. So, art as religion without God, a kind of alternative religion for atheists, in the words of Sarah Thornton, or art and religion together addressing the big questions, philosophising together. Perhaps, as I said, people mix their beliefs and mix their rituals. As you know, in September, Queen Elizabeth II died after a reign lasting 70 years. She was not only the head of the Church of England, but a devout Christian, who every year in her Christmas address to the nation, the British nation, spoke about the cross. Her funeral liturgies, in traditional Anglican form, but also with ecumenical participation from leaders of other Christian churches, including the Catholics, were watched by four billion people. At the same time, people carried their large opportune screens over there. Not only did about 100,000 people go to the lying in state of the Queen's body before the funeral, but they carried out their own rituals of grieving. A popular ritual was inspired by the children's fictional character Paddington Bear. At her last Christmas, and as part of the celebrations of her 70 years as Queen, Queen Elizabeth acted in a short film with Paddington Bay, in which they had afternoon tea together. Another ritual which has survived secularisation, afternoon tea in Britain, even if it's now just something occasional. People were very touched by this film. In the Paddington Bear stories, Paddington always keeps a marmalade sandwich under his hat, for emergencies, he has no food. So people came to Buckingham Palace and left little Paddington Bear figures in memory of the Queen. Some even left marmalade sandwiches. This caused a public health problem, they went rotten, so officials intervened and asked them to stop doing this. Sorry, we're pretty sorry. In my family, my great aunt died at the age of 94, nearly as old as the Queen, in September 2021. She was cremated. You know what cremated means? Yeah. And my aunt and I kept our ashes in a castle at home for a year. When they watched the Queen's funeral on TV, they put great aunt Morgan's castle next to them so she could not have the funeral too. I attended the spring of the Paracas. Officials from the crematorium sprinkled Audrey's ashes in the shape of a heart. On a road trip, one of my aunts said a few words. The whole ceremony took less than one minute. Then we had to do the same. Now, all of this was a ritual, a mixture of inherited Christianity, rituals become common to my nieces and spontaneously shared experiences, so the Queen has to be with Pennington and Bear, everybody does. And it shows that people are in touch with the news. People mean rich, not the people. There was participation in the Queen's funeral, posed by watching, watching the TV, and by acting out the rich. And traditional rituals can be adapted and repurposed. The traditional Anglican evening prayer service of Eden's Heart was adopted, was adapted as even new song. No personal influence influences on you. For the Our Face in Space Science Festival in Cambridge last summer, even new song is described as a choral work based on the candid responses from 
12 couples interviewed about extended trips to the moon. The title of celebrant is replaced by ground control. Ground control uses the traditional words we confess our faults. But the response is new. You make yourself vulnerable. They sang this in the true style of traditional words, so you don't know English call it sound. And we confess our faults, and then people responded, you make yourself vulnerable. And it carried on like this, and it was done outside, done in a cathedral, the Magnificat of the Moon Dimittis will attend, and they were being inspired by scripture, with some mention of God. People came, who don't normally come to church. Many were the parents and children of the choirs which were placed in the courts. So what does this amount to? Secularisation of Christian worship against St Paul's injunction do not be conformed to this present world. Or is, was this a bridge between church and secular society? Or a daring new presentation of Christianity? As I said, I know Catholics who are trained as secular celebrants, precisely in order to be a praying presence of Christ among people who have lost all regular contact with the church. So, we are working towards a deeper understanding of the question of liturgy as state and as being human between church and society. We find divisions within the church about liturgy, as I said earlier, and I want to go a bit deeper into this now, and set the same Indeed, there is a crisis about the liturgy, as indicated by Pope Francis' letter, Desiderio Desiderato, when he pleads for a rediscovery of liturgical celebration and for a recovery of an arts celebrandi, an art celebrity. We found already common ground between the church and society in that people might draw on Christian liturgy and Christian art for their own inspiration. They watch the Queen's funeral, they take something from Anglican evening prayer. And of course, they have their own folk liturgies, and people always have them, even in Christian centuries. The difference, of course, is that in Western Europe, the great majority of people now do not attend church regularly. In Britain, 52% do not identify as religious at all. They may or not believe in God. Many are atheistic in the sense of being without God, just God doesn't figure in their lives. But they may be spiritual but not religious, drawing on practices such as yoga, or drawing on religions such as Buddhism, but without identifying as Buddhists either or eco-spirituality, finding connection and uplift in nature. And of course, drawing on the arts, a kind of alternative religion for atheists. But what, let's be honest, beyond moral teaching we must look after the environment. What does modern Christianity say about nature, nature's spiritual value, about spirituality and nature, spirituality in nature? How integral, really, are the arts to Christian theology, spirituality and catechesis today, or is it just a nice thing to have? So in that case, it seems that church and religion and people are very separated, often without a bridge at all, between church and society. So how do we approach this? Veronica and I propose a new approach of re-embodying the liturgy, first as a bridge within the church, since the church itself is divided. Second, re-embodying liturgy as a bridge to a society which is body focused, whether through physical practices such as yoga, through pursuing physical beauty, and that really hurts people sometimes, or through a basic philosophy of materialism, you can think the physical is the way it's not So let me explain what I mean, where I'm coming Now, we talk about re-embodying the embodied approach to liturgy. I want to deal with objection. When we do theology, theos, logos, we are doing words. I'm doing words right now. We need words to talk about experiences, to understand whether we are sharing experience. What did you experience? Oh yes, I experienced that. I experienced something different. 
For example, you and I might both go to a yoga class. I might like it, you might not. Unless we show it in our faces, as I say, the only way to find out is by having a conversation. So words are needed. Then we discover whether or not we are united. Mere ritual without words can become subjective. Louis Marie has spoken of the danger of phantasmagoria, whereby literature becomes privatized. We all go to a liturgy, but each one of us interprets it according to his or her own imagination. So Victor Turner's idea of ritual coming out of the spontaneous is maybe a bit simplistic. For example, there are anarchists in a squat in Cambridge who are doing a wonderful job providing free community meals and gathering community with music evenings as well. But there is a sign I saw before outside of the house, maybe on a dinner night. No hate speech, that's fine. No animal products. Words actually defining a doctrine of this community. Well, the problem is, if you think it's okay to eat meat, can you be part of that community? Do you need to go and build a different community with your own separate rituals? How do we actually gather them and not exclude them? The loss of words and the loss of actual agreement about the meaning of ritual, the meaning of Christianity, is perhaps what happened in the late Middle Ages. It needed the rediscovery of scriptura, the word of God, a process started by Martin Luther and others, and brought forward in a major way by the Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council. The reform of the liturgy gave a much greater place to the liturgy of the word. It was no longer merely the conformness of the mass of the catechumens, but a ritual in its own right. Also, the 1960s, the time of the liturgical reform, has a special relationship with words. I was born then, but I'm going on what seniors in my community have told me, the research I've done. As a time of protest and revolt, it meant people, especially younger people, saying the unsayable, often crying with pressure. French middle class Catholics I spoke to, who were students in that generation, spoke, spoke of growing up in a climate of conformity in which you didn't ask questions. Catholicism seemed to be part and parcel of bourgeois values, which might or might not be particularly Christian in themselves. But if those bourgeois values were backed up by the unchanging Catholic faith, the bourgeois values, therefore, led by themselves, became unchangeable. We don't do that. These people spoke to me of Pondus Apachon, which means literally speaking up, literally taking one's word, and not having it taken away from you, not being repressed. The liturgy of the word and liturgy in one's own language that you could hear directly and respond in a dialogue with the priests who faced you rather than that were all very important to these people I spoke of. At the same time, something very curious was happening in the United States. Some of the same students who were very vocal and very articulate in revolt against existing social structures, turned to the choreographer Anna Halpern and asked her to create new rituals, one of which was called Ceremony of Us, as in Us, Uns, but also the United States. This Ceremony of Us challenged racial segregation by having black and white people dancing together. And notice it is called Ceremony, like liturgy. But unlike many of the ceremonies these young people have attended in their lives, whether church services or university graduations, it was meaningful for them. They had words to speak about something which was more powerful for them than words. Speaking myself as a musician and poet as well as a theologian, I'm also aware that poetry does something new with words, and music takes us beyond words. I'm also aware that when I write poetry and music and perform on the piano and organ, both theology and philosophy help to guide and structure the process, help me understand what I'm doing. Jacques Langton, married to the poet, um, Vice of Uman Seva, 
said that the, arti the, the artist is an intellectual who makes a dust. In Genesis, God's word creates the world. The word makes it. God is an artist. And our liturgy is like theatre. It integrates words with gesture, movement, music, and architecture. But again, people see and hear Christians talking a lot, using lots of words, arguing with each other with words, arguing about words, arguing about the limits of words. Earlier this year, I organised a conference at Margaret Roman Institute on Catholics' experience of liturgy. This was an attempt to reconcile conflict between progressives and traditionalists. We were blessed with very generous and kind of discussion. We were really good to each other. But what was interesting is that many progressives love best about Vatican II, the liturgy of the world, while traditionalists who like the old Latinists were often most interested in the non term Particularly young people who go to the Latin Mass. It wasn't that it was conservative values, but, but there was gesture, image, silence. But again, in this disagreement, what was it looking at to people in the world? How disunited we look? I remember seeing a Lutheran church in Zachary, uh, near Potsdam. You can't see it in the picture. I lost my old photos. But the opening of John's Gospel. Unfunded by us, what is sculpted into the stones. This deep community, the word and the body of the church together, the word in the body of the church. Again, this brings us back to the theatre. Now, liturgy is not the same as theatre, but it has to recall Wittgenstein's point a lot of family resemblances. Theatre has words, but not just words, it has movement and gesture, life. Singing, signal, often the props are a sign more than the whole thing. For example, a few ropes might tell us we're on the ship. And there is a relationship between actors and audience. Though I would not like to say this is analogous to the clergy and people relationship. That sounds maybe a bit too active passive, even though it's too simple in an analysis of theatre. There does need to be shared involvement. We don't share our understanding of the symbol, like mourners of Queen Elizabeth sharing understanding of Adams and Bear in his marmalade sandwich is related to the Queen. Then we will have problems celebrating liturgy together. And if we can't celebrate liturgy in a common understanding as church, well, how can we ever build bridges with society? It's not simply a matter of agreeing verbally about what a symbol means, agreeing what is true Christian doctrine. You know, water washing, baptism, etc. Liturgical anthropology touches a deeper level of us than that. It is more holistic. James K. A. Smith says, having fallen prey to the intellectualism of modernity, both Christian worship and Christian pedagogy have underestimated the importance of this bodily story next. This inextricable link between imagination, narrative, and embodiment, thereby forgetting the ancient Christian sacramental wisdom carried in the historic practices of Christian worship and the embodied legacies of spiritual and monastic disciplines. We have failed to recognize the degree and extent to which sec secular liturgies do implicitly capitalize on our embodied penchant for story formation like the patterns in there. It's a story, it's a picture. This becomes a way to account for Christian assimil assimilation to consumerism, to nationalism, and various stripes of egoism. These isms have all the best embodied stories. The devil has had all the best liturgies. So, to build bridges with a radically changing society, Veronica and I would therefore like to propose a radically different approach, re-embodiment first as a bridge within the church, since the church is divided. Secondly, re-embodying liturgy as a bridge to a society which is bodily focused, whether through physical practices, which is not just talking about the embodiment, but actually doing it. And during this therefore, we will have the opportunity for real embodied experiences. 
Now, embodiment is a fashionable word. In English, we have a word hackneyed, which means saying something so much and so often that it loses its meaning, it becomes banal. The body has become such a focus of contemporary culture. The fit and beautiful body, which is a source either of happiness and a sense of success, or of suffering and a sense of failure, as Vagina and Quinn has shown. An impossible beauty can be demanded of the body when the standard of body is measured against the standard of beauty is measured against a digitally altered image, phones, the computer screen itself. There is also, amid extreme individualism and or self-preoccupation, a sense of the breakdown of the social body. Yet, at the same time, much non-religious spirituality is somatocentric. Practices such as yoga, tai chi, sauna, or forest painting. The spa is sometimes seen and marketed in spiritual terms. This manifests in Catholic practices too, sometimes in unlucky places. So, so one of our masses at Blackfriars in Cambridge is a Latin mass. And the young people who come often don't identify as traditionalists as such, but with their modern culture they're drawn to a liturgy celebrated in a dead language, and somehow the words are saying they don't really want to think of it. It's which resists in the media of knowledge, or the thought work of it, which is both sciences and gestures. As I say, the never really likes that, but some do. And it sometimes means that catechesis can appear very monocentric. If you look at that image there, I think that's Carl uh, and Sarah, always the same gesture. And what's the other one? So, in order to move this forward over the next three decades, we are going to look, we need to establish some hermeneutical principles. First, our epistemology. We will draw on Thomas Aquinas' principle that all knowledge comes to us through the senses. According to Aquinas, what our senses present us with is not the thought. I know that that's a table, but an image. Our potential intellect receives the images. Then on the basis of the data they provide, the agent intellect extracts their universal nature. So I know that that's a table because it's square, it's got four legs and so on. But Aquinas takes us further. He says that actually the intellect needs to be converted to the impressions it receives in order to mirror the universal nature existing in a particular thing. I think pretty much shame speaking about wisdom. There is a reciprocal action, a relationship between the thing and the sin. It might actually disturb it. It's easy for me, coming from an Anglo-Saxon background, to read Aquinas epistemology through a lens of analytical philosophy. Yes, it's all, yeah, what you see is what's there, that's fine. But this is going too fast. He actually says converted, it's a subjunctive, it must be converted. There is a moral requirement for me to be converted by what I see. No imposing the theories on that, bringing down a cookie cutter or a system on the raw material of real embodied life. There is rather a turning towards what the senses bring to us, often unbidden, the manual evidence on the face. I turn towards you when you speak to me, body and word together. And your face might challenge everything I do. I might have to change my view. If I see a hungry person, can I walk away from her with his face? Now this is actually a turn, this is an act of penitence to let you know. I turn away from my street, straight line. To receive something new, to be to believe, to be changed by it. Catherine Pixel has suggested that this is a mediating voice between divine and human. It's reflexive. So seeing death with my senses, which opens me to the spiritual. So that's our first principle: an epistemology of the senses. 
Our second principle will be resourcement, great practical to hermeneutical method, developed by theologians like Chulu, Kolba, Rana, Delubak, and others. It is a return to the sources, both in going back to Christian sources, which have been forgotten, and also a return in our theological practice to what the sources teach and what they show us. One of these sources are mainly texts. They also include art, architecture, liturgical gesture, liturgical movement. And very importantly, this is not simply going back to the past. Let's celebrate the history like they did in Syria in the third century, or not in Syria. Rather, the resource of all is a source of reading movement. What happens when we put the bottom of this tradition in dialogue? in our own life situation and our own society. So, Veronica and I will look at early Christian baptism in 1850, put into dialogue with the contemporary rituals of Saha and Yoga. Our third principle will be early Christian cosmology. Much of my own research in the past 20 years has been on early Christian cosmology. The necessity for this actually came out of my pastoral work with artists. Many of them were spiritual but not religious. I found that they had a strong sense of the spiritual in nature and in the cosmos. For example, somebody might say, I don't go to church, but I like to dance and feel. It makes me feel connected with them. I also practice astrology, basically. This was a big theological challenge. As a church, we have become good at dialogue with other religions, and this usually starts from common ground. For example, believing in one God, or the Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters, or having some common practice like the church and prayer. A great conversation with my rabbi in literature. But with my non religious interlocutors, who dance in the field, well, we worship in church and we don't dance in church. We don't really care about being one with nature, and although we have moral sense of being we don't have spirituality. And as for astrology, that's condemned by Bible. I found that before Galileo and to this day of the Christianese, the church had a strong sense that Christ came to save not just us, but the whole of creation. According to Jewish apocalypse, in fact, the Enoch text, which were well known in early Christianity, the angels were stars, the stars were angels. Fallen angels were the stars which went out of war. They were dancers who left the choreography. The choreography that God had appointed them. And when they did this, they called for seasons to happen at the wrong time, just like the global war. And the more I read these seasons, the more I realised that the church world religion in early Christianity was not between religion and the sect between human and the non-human, nor between the spiritual and the physical. Rather, the division that the early Christians understood was between the angels of God and the fallen angels of the devil, the cosmos that the devil had tried to take over. That would be bad. And the fallen cosmic forces, all speak to us in Ephesians, which we see happening in environmental injustice, in social injustice, in destruction, selfishness, hatred of others, hatred of self. So we're going to return to the sources by looking in detail at the back history of Joseph Lopez, the oldest Christian, known Christian structure in the world. You can see it there, it's good stuff. And we will discover and understand in the literature where the bodily was the spiritual, and human beings found themselves reborn to a new way of being community, both with other human beings and with non-human beings, a relationship with the whole cosmos. And every day, I promise you, there will be not just words, but somatic experience. So, there are our three principles. Epistemology of the senses, all knowledge comes from through the senses. I convert what I think, how I live, according to what comes to me. Resource not going back to the sources, going back to what they tell us, putting it in dialogue with modern society to renew the church, 
and early Christian cosmology. Now, there is a timetable for those of you who those of you who were able to join us. Um, but I think that's quite enough for me for now. I need to get my voice in this. So uh, um, now I'm very happy to be Zera, Paula, Barbu, and Discussion to uh to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh,